Good morning, boys and girls. It's about 11, yeah, 11.20, 11.22, I guess, on my computer here. And um, I'm here to read you the fourth chapter of the K. Yesterday, as we listened, um, we found out that Timothy um, <laughs> seemed, according to Philip, he was a very stubborn and he wouldn't give him very much water so he was he was upset with that um also um they got some fish the the flying fish that jumped onto the raft and philip refused to eat any of it because they thought it was disgusting to eat raw fish with which i kind of agree with him i'm not a big raw fish person um so tim philip wouldn't eat it so we're going to find out today what continues to happen as they are on their raft on the ocean. <clears throat> Total darkness blotted out the sea, and it became cold and damp. Timothy took the shelter down, and we both pulled our shirts and pants back on. They were stiff from salt and felt clammy. The wind picked up, blowing fine chill spray across the raft. Then the stars came out. We stayed in the middle of the raft side by side as it drifted aimlessly over the sea. Stew Cat rubbed his back against the bottoms of my feet and then curled up down there. I was glad because he was warm. I was thinking that it was very strange for me, a boy from Virginia, to be lying beside this giant Negro out on the ocean. And I guess maybe Timothy was thinking the same thing. Once... Our bodies touched. We both drew back, but I drew back faster. In Virginia, I knew they'd always lived in their sections of town and us in ours. A few times, I'd gone down through the shacks of Colored Town with my father. They sold spicy crabs in one shack, I remember. I saw them mostly swimming in the summer down by the river, fishing or swimming naked, but I didn't really know any of them. And in Wilmestad, I didn't know them very well either. Henrik van Boven did, though, and he was much easier with them. I asked, Timothy, where's your home? St. Thomas, he said. Charlotte Amelie on St. Thomas, he added. Tis a virgin island. Then you are American, I said. I remembered from school that we had bought the virgin islands from Denmark. He laughed. Oh, I suppose, young boss, I never gave it much thought. I sail all the islands, as well as Venezuela, Colombo, Panama. I just never gave it much thought that I was American. I said, your parents were African, Timothy? He laughed low and soft. <laughs> Young boss, you want me to say I true come from Africa? You say what you want. It was just that Timothy looked very much like the men I'd seen in jungle pictures with a flat nose and heavy lips. He shook his head. I have no recollection or anything except these islands. Tis pure outrageous, but I do not remember anything about a place called Africa. I didn't know if he was telling the truth or not. He looked pure African. I said, well, what about your mother? Now there was deep laughter in his voice. "'Tis even more outrageous. I do not remember a father or a mother. I was raised by a woman called Hannah Gum. "'Then you are an orphan,' I said. Mm, "'I guess, young boss, I guess.' He was chuckling to himself, rich and deep. I looked over toward him, but again he was just a shadowy shape, a large mound. "'How old are you, Timothy?' I asked. "'Oh, that fact is also very mysterious.' Little more than sixty, cause de muscles in my legs be speaking to me, complain all de time. But to be true, I do not know exact. I was amazed that any man shouldn't know his own age. I was almost certain now that Timothy had indeed come from Africa, but I didn't tell him that. I said, I'm almost twelve. I wanted him to know I was almost 12 so that he would stop treating me as though I were half that age. Oh, that is very important age, Timothy agreed. Now you must get some natural sleep. Tomorrow might be a very long day and we have much to do. I laughed. There we were on that bucking raft with nothing to do except watch for schooners or aircraft. 
What do we have to do? I asked. His eyes groped through the darkness for mine. He came up on his elbows. Stay alive, young boss. That's what we have to do. Soon it became very cold and I began shivering. Part of it was coldness, but there was also fear. If the rap raft tipped over, sharks would slash at us, I knew. My head was aching violently again. During the day, the pain had been dull, but now it was shooting along both sides of my head. Once, sometime during the early night, I felt his hand on my forehead. Then he shifted my body, placing it on the other side of him. He murmured, Young boss, de wind a shift. You'll be warmer on de side. I was still shivering, and soon he gathered me against him, and Stu Cat came back to be a warm ball against my feet. I could now smell Timothy tucked up against him. He didn't smell like my father or my mother. Father had always smelled of bay rum, the shaving lotion he used, and mother smelled of some kind of perfume or cologne. Timothy smelled different and strong, like the black men who worked on the decks of the tankers when they were loading. After a while, I didn't mind the smell of Tim the smell because Timothy's back was very warm. The raft plunged on across the light swells throughout the long night. <clears throat> I do not think he slept much during the night, but I've been told that old people didn't sleep much anyway. <laughs> I woke up when there was a pale band of light to the east, and Timothy said, Oh, you farewell, young boss. How is de head? It still hurts, I admitted. Timothy said, Oh, a crack on de head takes a few days to go away. He opened the trap on the raft to pull out the water keg and the tin containing the biscuits, the chocolate squares, and dry matches. I sat up feeling dizzy. He allowed me half a cup of water and two hard biscuits, then fed Stewcat with a wedge of leftover flying fish. We ate in silence as the light crept steadily over the smooth, oily sea. The wind had died and already the sun was beginning to scorch. Timothy chewed slowly on half a biscuit. Today, young boss, a schooner will pass. I'd better jump on that. I hope so, I said. I do think we are not far from Providencia and San Andres. I looked hard at Timothy. Are those islands? He nodded. I kept looking at him. It seemed there was a film, a haze, separating us. I rubbed my eyes and I opened them again, but the haze was still there. I glanced over at the red ball of sun, now clear of the horizon. It seemed dim, and I said, I think there's something wrong with my eyes. Timothy said, I warn you, you looked direct at the sun yesterday. Oh, yes, that was it. I looked at the sun too much. Today, Timothy said, do not even look at the water. The glare is bad, too. He went about setting up triangles for our shelter, and I took off my clothes. After he had draped my pants and my shirt, I got under the shelter. The pain in my head was almost unbearable now, and I remembered moaning. Timothy tore off a piece of his shirt from the shelter roof, soaked it in fresh water, and placed it over my eyes. There was worry in his voice as he talked. <clears throat> a while later, I took the cloth, cloth off my eyes and looked up. The inside of our shelter was shadowy and dark, but the pain had begun to go away. It doesn't hurt as much anymore, I said. Ah, see, it just takes time, young boss. I put the cool cloth over my eyes and went to sleep again. When I woke up, it was night, yet the air felt hot, and the breeze that came across the raft was warm. I lay there thinking. What time is it? I asked. Oh, about ten. At night? There was puzzlement in his voice. Tis day. I put my hand in front of my face. Even in the very blackest night, you can see your own hand. But I cannot see mine. I screamed to Timothy, I'm blind! I'm blind! What? His voice was a frightened roar. Then I knew he was bending over me. I felt his breath in my face, and he said, Oh, young boss, you cannot be blind. He pulled me roughly from the shelter. Look at the sun, look at the sun, he ordered. His hands pointed at my, 
pointed my face. His hands pointed my face. I felt a strong warmth against it, but everything was black. The silence seemed to last forever as he held my face toward the sun. Then a long, shuddering sigh came from his great body. He said very gently, Now, young boss, you must lie down and rest. What has happened will go away. Tis all natural temporary. But his voice was hollow. I got down on the hot boards, blinking my eyes again and again, trying to lift the curtain of blackness. I touched them. They didn't feel any different. Then I realized that the pain had gone away. It had gone away, but left me blind. <clears throat> I could hear my voice saying far off, I don't feel any pain, Timothy. The pain has gone away. I guess he was trying to think it all out. In a few minutes, he answered, Oh, once over round Barbados, a man had an outrageous crack on his head when the sailing boom shift. This man was blind too. Three whole day he saw the night. Then it true went away. Do you think that will happen to me? I think that be true, young boss. Then he became very quiet. After a moment, lying there in darkness, hearing the creak of the raft and feeling its motion, it all hit me. I was blind, and we were lost at sea. I began to crawl, screaming for my mother and my father, but felt, felt his hard hands on my arms. He held me tight, and he said, low and soft, Young boss, young boss, he kept repeating it. I'll never forget that first hour of knowing I was blind. I was so frightened that it was hard for me to breathe. It was as if I'd been put inside something that was all dark and I couldn't get out. I remember that at one point my fear turned to anger. Anger at Timothy for not letting me stay in the water with my mother and anger at her because I was on the raft. I began hitting him and I remember him saying, oh, if that will make you better, go ahead. After a while, I felt very tired, and I fell back on the hot boards. And we'll stop there. So they're still on the raft, and now Philip has become blind, which is a whole nother tragedy that is happening here. Um, so the next chapter is chapter five, and the very first, I will... I will give you the very first um, paragraph. It says this. I guess it was toward noon on the third day aboard the raft that Timothy said tensely, I hear a motor. And we'll stop there. Okay. All right. I know it's a little bit of a cliffhanger, but good story. Very good story. I hope you're listening in it. I hope you're enjoying it because it is, it's a great one. So um, we will look forward to um, seeing some of you tomorrow on our Zoom meeting. I enjoyed talking with you, uh, about six of you today, so that was great. And just make sure you're working hard and doing what your mom and dad ask you to do. And I will look forward to talking with you in your Zoom meeting tomorrow or Thursday, and then all of us together on Friday. So, all right, I love you guys. Bye.